Uh, I'm Saeed Choudhury from the Sheridan Library at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague Greg Britton, who's the editorial director at Johns Hopkins University Press, and Wendy Queen, uh, also from JG Press, but the director of uh, Project Muse. We have uh, a couple of other folks in the audience that would like to recognize uh, Barbara Klein Pope, who's the director <coughs> of JG Press. She's here as well. And we have a former colleague, Terry Allen, who's now at MIT Press, but was involved with this project when she was at Hopkins. And Mark Patton, one of our software developers, uh, who's here to keep me honest, I think. Um, <laughs> so uh, we're here to talk about the Open Educational Resources and the Black Press in America project. Uh, this is a project that uh, has been initiated by Professor Kim Dowler at Purdue University when she had a visiting appointment at Hopkins. And she's working with a group of other scholars to examine historical African-American newspapers to better understand the black experience from their perspective, through their eyes, their words, uh, their experiences. She received uh, a, a fellowship from the American Council on Learned Societies to produce some open digital monographs and originally published the Sheridan Libraries to do this uh, for a couple of reasons. One, she likes working with libraries. But second, felt like it would be an interesting opportunity to do some innovative things in terms of publishing uh, with libraries. So as I worked with uh, Kim through this fellowship, it occurred to me that if we had followed that original trajectory, where we would have ended up basically is having a series of EPUB files within the Hopkins Institutional Repository. Now don't get me wrong, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but we, we thought we could do better. Uh, and I think what you'll see is as we've gone through this journey, of working with our colleagues in the press, uh, we're going to end up in a place that I think is much better for everyone involved, uh, particularly the, the scholars themselves. So a little bit about you know, why this is important from a, a, a sort of topic or scholarly perspective. This is actually a screenshot from uh, a CNN article earlier this, uh, sorry, last week. And you can see it says why the black, black press is more relevant than ever. And it talks about, uh, even in the case of uh, during Lyndon Johnson's presidency during a lot of earlier times, that the, the black press was not being represented. Uh, its voice was not being shared in sort of the mainstream media. And it was clearly showing a different view uh, of current events. And I think it's comfortable <coughs> to assert that that is still true today. Uh, if you look at a lot of the events that are happening today, uh, they, there's a very different viewpoint depending on what news channel or news media you may consume. And there is, in fact, this very clear, direct voice coming from the African-American community that we're trying to capture uh, through this project in particular. Now, getting back to uh, the story of how we started to work together, uh, I, I actually have uh, an engineering background. And when I was in school, I was told by my advisor to think of engineering as the sort of interplay between people, products, and processes. So those three sort of uh, facets and the workflows that connect them. Um, so this is something that I have thought of throughout my academic and, and now my professional career. And in many ways, I think what tends to happen is we converge very quickly on the products. We think very quickly about what's the ultimate output going to look like. Uh, the EPUB files in the institutional repository, for example. But if you start to think more about the people that are involved throughout these kinds of activities and the processes that each, the, the authors themselves, the libraries, and the presses might have, you know what? I'm not sure where that music started. <laughs> it's for a fact. It, yes. yeah. <laughs> I cued it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you don't like what I'm saying, just listen to the music. <laughs> so, getting back to this idea of people, processes, and products, uh, and the workflows that connect them, we in essence basically started to ask the question, what is the rich view, the richer, broader view of all the people that are involved? Uh, what are all the workflows they might, they might adopt? And quite frankly, rather than showing up at some point to say the university press and saying, here's a bunch of EPUB files, deal with them, uh, work with them, we wanted to work with the press in the early stage in an iterative way to learn more about how the press actually does these kinds of things in the current way, in the future way, and come up with a much more continuous, dynamic, iterative type of approach, uh, which I'll give you some examples at the end, but the transition over to Greg, uh, because the next stage in this conversation was to introduce Tim Dowling to Greg and basically start a conversation between the authors and the press. Thanks, Saeed. My name is Greg Britton. I'm the editorial director at the Johns Hopkins University Press. We publish about 170 new books a year. 
We publish 90 journals in the humanities and social sciences. We have our own distribution center, and we're the institutional home of Project Muse. Um, the way Wendy Queen is running it, um, shortly we'll be describing the uh, Project Muse as being the institutional home of the Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, this, uh, before we move forward, I, I just want to say a few more words about the black press in America. It, it, it's really something that begins um, in earnest in the 1820s in America, and it coalesces around a single issue. It coalesces around the anti-slavery movement. Um, Frederick Douglass, uh, who's on the screen, and of course is an example of somebody who's done an amazing job, and you've been hearing about him more and more. He'll be recognized um, quite a bit. Um, is, uh, what a, what a, what a terrific guy. We give it up for Frederick Douglass. Um, he is the first editor of the North Star in 1847. Uh, and really, I think of as, as a, a central character in the founding of the black press. The black press, though, continues to grow and peaks sometime in the mid 20th century, um, where it is uh, at, at its height has about 150 uh, independent newspapers from Chicago and Detroit to Baltimore to Oakland uh, and Atlanta. It is, um, uh, when you think of these papers, they're, they're community papers. They are mostly family run. They are, uh, by their very nature, small uh, operations. They, are, uh, they serve as a sort of community voice. Um, and they are, um, uh, and they are filled, if you look at these papers, they're filled with not only news told from the, the black perspective, they, they're filled with news, with op-eds, with with uh, other things, uh, there are recipes and there's uh, there are short stories that are published and poetry written by community members. They are this amazing uh, part of the cultural record um, that has been overlooked in many ways. Um, they are understudied uh, by historians. They were under collected by libraries, and um, and I think because of that. Um, uh, they are this, uh, there's this enormous body of, of work that, uh, that we don't have terrific access to. So when Said called, I was really intrigued uh, by this idea of, of uh, uh, participating in this project. I knew we had something to offer. Presses have always been good at one thing, which is to take authors and their ideas and transform them, package them for a marketplace. Um, we do that in lots of ways. We manage peer review, we develop works, we copy edit works and design them and produce them, and probably most importantly, we market them to, uh, to readers. Um, but getting uh, publishers involved in a project complicates things. I, I remember having a conversation early on with Saeed uh, when I said, you know, authors are going to want books, and we know how to make books, but that raises a question of how we pay for these. And we know how to, we know how to make books and sell them, that's what we do, um, but if these are going to be open books, open access books, it complicates things. And that was all part of this, this conversation. We really started with this fundamental question, why don't you switch to the next slide, what do scholars really want? And what, as it turns out, scholars want is, is kind of everything. They want to be able to exchange ideas early on with other scholars. They want the affordances that the press offers in terms of shaping and professional packaging of things. They love the credentialing and recognition they get from publishing books from a university press. Um, they also, it was really important to the scholars when we talked with them that they have something that is permanent and lasting and that came down to this fundamental um, uh, kind of lowest tech uh, denominator of, of print. Um, they, but at the same time they wanted these to be open but they wanted them to be marketed uh, the way our traditional books were marketed. Um, and they w also wanted all the affordances of the open web, the discoverability, the, um, the 
audiovisual components that you could add on a project like this, but but within context, not just little snippets, but 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 all of the the material um, that they had collected, and they wanted other scholars to contribute to this. So this turned next slide. This turned into something that we thought instead of we, we're collecting data, um, the the scholars are writing short monographs about this. They're using this material. This could, we started thinking of it within the press as a book series. Um, but as we got into this, we began to think there's something more here. We have this fantastic collection of data. We have scholars working on this. How are we going to reach a larger market? And at that point, I realized I had to text Wendy Queen. Okay. So I'll start by saying thank you to my colleagues um, who've given me such a strong voice in this project and process. And the timing of that text to me about Black Press in America couldn't be better um, because we're in the final stages of Muse Open, which is a grant from the Andrew Mellon Foundation to further the distribution, usability, discoverability, and accessibility monographs um, open access as an extension of an aggregation. So and at this point, we actually didn't know what content that we were going to feed into Muse Open, so very welcome that tax. And so in order to achieve the goals of the grant, we've constructed new capabilities to extend the platform and ensure OA content receives the, ha the same high quality treatment as gated content. And as of the summer of 2018, we will have a browser-based reading experience. And this is where we break free from the PDF and allowing more flexibility to create content connections and conversations, which are going to be really important when Saeed gets to the demo portion of this. We'll have over 300 OA monographs integrated with the gated content all downstream activities taken care of. So that's the MARC records, the linking partners, the preservation. Again, making sure that the OA content is treated as equally as the gated content. And we're also testing business and analytics models. Um, and both of those are, are quite difficult. So that will be going past the launch this summer. And another component that was important to the grant was to explore partnerships to support our efforts in creating modern, cost-efficient infrastructure and solutions that fit into the larger publishing distribution infrastructure. So happy to partner with my colleague at the press and my colleague at the library. Um, but we needed more partners than that. So our workflow development around Muse Open, we have to always think about how do we transform scholarly content at scale. So Muse's goal to keep our costs down, distribute as much as the royalties back to the publishers, comes up with what types of systems do we need to make that possible. And to do this for our open access content, um, we embraced using community supported open source software to transform the EPUB to HTML. And up until this point, all components of Muse have been built in house, and we made the decision to pivot and create reusable infrastructure and workflow components that have a lasting impact for the community. In order to do this, we partnered with COCO, the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation, which I'm, I'm so happy. I see them in the press about every other day at this point, and um, I'll give the endorsement right now that they, they are the real deal here. And so what COCO has done for us, they have a set of tools and a flexible framework called Inc. And Inc. can take a single EPUB file and break it into parts. And for Muse Open, we are serving at the chapter level and want as much flexibility in the format to create new types of containers for future works. The piece Coco has built for Muse is the conversion from EPUB to HTML. And I should stress, Inc. is a standalone system that can do many functions. So this satisfies many objectives from Muse Open as there are reusable parts, the workflow for our publishers and for our internal staff is low touch, and that's keeping the cost down for our publishers, and it's using open source components which allow us to work more efficiently. And COCO is also developing for projects such as Editoria out of the University of California Press, 
So basically, a lot of these pieces can be put together to create a seamless um, workflow um, and not have one, one shop doing all of the work. Um, and BPA for us is a bridge to explore and find solutions as to how to make content more useful and open educational resources. So that's not part of the grant. The grant ends, but this is an opportunity to extend what we've been doing through the grant into other areas. And BPA, to me, represents a step beyond the integration of OA content on the Muse platform and a step beyond the discoverability of OA content. In our community, there are many ways we are still siloing materials platform to platform or dictating that platforms are format specific. Redundant deposits are one way many have attempted to make users have access to related materials for specific uses. There is a lack of demonstrating new ways to connect content and create new pathways for discovery. Um, not one platform should be able to do all aspects of publishing and discovery and engagement and learning. The inclusion of Muse in this project allows the balance of experimentation of print, digital monographs, and supplemental materials. We hope that through this collaboration, um, we further the discussion in relating content, disaggregate it, and a robust and engaging user experience. It also represents the opportunity to explore what print means when clustered with many types of digital materials. So again, we're not trying to create a boutique service here, but forward thinking and basically a very assertive use of technology and thinking about what linked data can do for us. And the project is unique for Muse because it is not the norm that we have the opportunity to work directly with authors in the beginning of a project to sort of understand what their vision is and understand the content to know what types of tools um, to build around that content and it basically being able to capture the author's vision. And what is also unique about this project is you know, Muse is over 20 years old now, and it started between uh, um, the library and the press. And now we have the library, the press, and the authors involved in sort of the next generation of where we want to go. And I'm grateful to partner with the authors, but I'm particularly grateful to be able to partner with the experienced technical staff at the library and see, see where we can take this. And with that said, that's the experienced technical person at the library. So. I will note that the music stopped when Greg started talking. So <laughs> maybe it'll come back. We could sing for you. So, one of the interesting aspects of this, again, keep in mind that the original output would have been four EPUB files in Hopkins Institutional Repository. At this stage, you can already see the story is much richer than that. And we are talking about turn books for the reasons that Greg has described that are important to the authors. So just be clear, that is the authors themselves pointed out why those reasons were important. The incorporation of open ebooks through the Muse Open grant and platform that Wendy just described is an extension, if you will, uh, of that kind of traditional press workflow into the sort of the modern or maybe even future workflows. And then this third tier of content we have talked about that basically is initially called supplemental materials. Another software developer in, in my group called it Gus probably not the best choice. So then Greg Britton came up with, what about Banneker? You know, he's uh, the first African-American printer, was sort of a Renaissance man. Uh, I think that's a very nice code name, but it was again during a meeting, sort of <coughs> a little bit later into the process where News Open was sitting in the room, where Wendy actually said, you know, I think of these as open educational resources. These are other kinds of resources that are connected to the print books, to the e-books that we're producing that maybe the library can take more of a lead in terms of how do they get incorporated into the <coughs> teaching and learning aspects that the authors, again, felt were very important about their books. These are not just scholarly books for research purposes, but they want them to be used in the learning and teaching environment. So we start to think about this much more as a set of open educational resources <coughs> as part of this bigger set of materials that, that are being produced at this point. So I'll, I'll give you a, a, a demonstration of the concept. We are being recorded, so I'm actually going to go through a, a set of screenshots. My laptop over there is, I think, still connected to the internet. 
uh, the Wi-Fi, and if it is, I'm happy to share it to you live, but I will go through a series uh, of, of screenshots. So just a couple of points to keep in mind before I go through those. We don't have the content yet, the digital content yet, from the, from the authors. So in the meantime, we're using content that we're developing for other digital humanities projects uh, at the libraries to demonstrate what, what capabilities may exist. Uh, what I'll show you is a Hamlet prompt book and a sample of the Ptolemy <coughs> text that actually comes from the Princeton University Libraries. And Omeka, which some of you may be familiar with as an application, plays a very important part in, in this particular activity uh, in two ways. One is as a place to gather the content from the authors. So sort of a nice, simple, low barrier way of uploading content, adding metadata according to a schema uh, that we define. And then the creation of digital exhibits. Uh, so one thing that when I was speaking with Greg early on in this project, he said that if you look at book sales, it's fairly typical that they'll spike at the beginning and then sort of drift over time. So we bounced around ideas, which tends to happen when you talk to people that you don't normally talk to. Uh, one idea that came up was, well, you must talk about these books at, say, you know, uh, professional society meetings, right? Yes. Well, what if we had exhibits timed with those professional society meetings? What if when the American Historic History Association meets, you have an exhibit of these materials that focuses on history? You know, what if the Art History Association meets, or so on and so on? You get the idea. So America is providing this platform for us to continuously <coughs> revisit those materials, tie them to things like the print books or the e-books or events. Uh, a key part of the technology that's driving all this is the I international image, sorry, international interoperability image framework. I always get that wrong. I know it's triple IF. Uh, is the underlying data model that we're using to, to drive a lot of this. And that we believe, as when you talked about, this is a new form of aggregation. The, the link data outputs that you'll see are, in fact, a new form of aggregation. So, if you uh, would start with the IIIF viewer, this would be the very first view you'll get. Uh, shameless plug for a session tomorrow morning where Mark Patton and I will go into more detail uh, about the various collections that you'll see here. But uh, I'm going to focus on this Hamlet prompt book that I had mentioned to you earlier. Uh, this was actually a prompt book that was used for a class this past summer at Hopkins uh, for what's being called intensive undergraduate uh, humanities courses with the Community College of, of, of Baltimore City. And we took this Hamlet prompt book and brought it into this IIIF environment in less than a month. And the scholar who was working with it basically said, you know, there's uh, on page one uh, of this prompt book, there's this, this is page one of, of that book. Uh, if you look in that bottom right corner on the sidebar, which are basically annotations or notes or any kind of marginalia uh, that you wish to add, there are actually some links that are relevant to that particular page, to that particular reference. One being a Wikipedia entry uh, on ghosts, as it's described in Hamlet, uh, and the other being an article in Muse. So you can see the concept here that you are working within a, a viewing or an annotation of <coughs> and you are moving into the materials that exist in other places, in other forms, and potentially you're getting back to materials in a mecca. Uh, the, the linking I just showed you there is a scholar individually going in and saying, I'm making that assertion. Those are important connections to make. This is another link that you can see. Uh, this is a Ptolemy text that I've described to you. And what you're seeing on the side there is a map that is linked automatically from the Perseus project. So we've been doing some investigation around uh, working with Perseus, which has a lot of controlled vocabularies, gazetteers, dictionaries, whatever you wish to call them. Uh, and a lot of APIs that we can, we can hit and, and sort of automatically go through the content and say, oh look, here's a place name, here's a reference. Let's put that content on the screen here as well. So that's another type of thing that uh, you, you'll be able to do. And then finally, I will show you uh, this screenshot, which is again, it's that page from the document, but if you look at the bottom of the screen, uh, you'll see powered by a mecca. So we're basically using an Omeka plugin to take IIIF manifests and bring them automatically into Omeka. So the idea again is the authors can work wherever they wish to work. Omeka, the viewer, wherever they choose, and we will harvest that material, put it together, and then repurpose it, reuse it, and you know, sort of display it uh, as these set of resources that could be used for research uh, and for teaching. So, uh, I'll, I'll end by showing this uh, screenshot here. We have uh, a project, uh, I'll call it a service now, called RMAP, 
which we developed with you know, the library's developed in partnership with Portico and IEEE through a grant from the Sloan Foundation. And our map is, in fact, a linked data protocol and tool. And what I'm showing you here is an actual linked data graph that we generated from the share network. Uh, and as you might imagine, what you're seeing here is, in fact, there's a certain type of author or a certain type of content, whatever you wish, and then connections between those. So you can imagine everything I just showed you can be exhibited or manifested in these maps. So these linked data graphs, or these discos as we call them in our map, are a way for someone to understand the connection. One of these could be an ISBN for a print book, or it could be a Muse identifier, or it could be a DOI, or it could be a IIIF manifest. It could be any of these kinds of content pieces uh, or varying types of contents that I've described in this kind of visual graph way. So this is an aggregation. This is, in my view, sort of the modern version of, of an aggregation. Contrast that with the four EPUB files in the institutional repository. <laughs> I, I, I hope you will agree that this is a much richer, much more uh, substantial and useful experience for the authors, for the readers, for the learners, uh, for the press, and for the libraries. So with that, we will uh, show you some acknowledgments of the organizations that have been funding this work. As Wendy said, actually the funds are for sort of pieces around uh, the BPA. We're doing a lot of this quote on the margins. Uh, you know what that means. Um, so I very much appreciate all the effort people put in. I think we have plenty of time for uh, questions if, if you have some. So thank you. <laughs>